Okay, let's get going. Thanks for that. Everyone okay with that? Okay, um, welcome to Conservation Biology for 2020. Um, this, I hope you'll find, is a pretty fun unit. It's a pretty soft unit in terms of there's not a huge amount of analytical type stuff in, involved in it, but there's lots of interactions. And what we're trying to do in the unit, Giles and myself, and um, is to try and give you some sort of experiences about what you might be thinking about doing next year. So you're now, you've done your hard swabs the first and second year. Third year is the time when you sort of consolidate all those, and hopefully you'll find conservation biology is this real mishmash of all sorts of different things that you would have done at uni. And it puts them together with the whole aim of trying to preserve biodiversity. And as you go through the uni, you'll find this sort of stuff. But the other thing that you may not be aware of is all the diversity of the stuff that you can do at the end of this thing. So one of the points of this unit is to have a whole bunch of field trips where we go out and the people that will be talking to you will be the heads of the BCA, the heads of Florida Conservation, the head of the Bavarian, Kings Park, we go behind the scenes at the zoo, look at the captive breeding program, etc. Et so, by that, what I mean is hopefully that you will pick up ideas about different things in, in areas of conservation biology and think about it in terms of whether you're going to be doing honours on it or whether it would interest you in doing it later on. Um, so, just in terms of what I do, um, this will be the only couple of slides you get of this because I'm not very good at climate work. I run a wildlife DNA lab and my area of uh, research is in an area called molecular ecology or conservation genetics. It's using DNA technology to try and understand how we can uh, manage different species and we'll get a couple of lectures on that in a couple of weeks' time, so I'll hang off on that. But one of the comments from the feedback from students from last year, and some of those comments are quite brutal, was I'm clearly not qualified to be teaching in the unit, I don't have any experience, and what am I doing at university? So I thought I'd slip a little slide in there to counteract some of the views that some people have of where our research is. And this is my area of research. Giles has an equivalent, if not better, international reputation in forest health and forest pathology. So you'll get some uh, talk later this afternoon by Giles. Um, Giles Hardy is a professor in, in plant pathology, basically. <coughs> But just to give you a bit of an idea about where I come from, I really have quite a lot of experience in conservation in the whole area. Um, similar to you guys, I did a degree at James Cook University on in marine biology, um, loved it, and in tropical biology. I then uh, managed to do a PhD looking at the molecular ecology of rock bodies. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the, in the lectures I give, so I won't go on about that. Um, I then did a postdoc in uh, Germany in a place called the University of Göttingen. Um, which is a very, very 700-year-old university um, in an ancient DNA lab there. I have over 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers, so I've got a relatively large publication record, and I've got five million bucks in research grants. The other thing that I've done is that I'm not just a shiny bum that sits in the lab all day, I've got 70,000 track nights of mammal data, so I've spent a lot of time in the field catching all sorts of different things. So, I don't just sit around yabbering, I'm actually involved in field work as well. Um, and I have a really active research lab. A lot of people don't realise that we don't sit around waiting for the Thursday lecture and that's all our life is at university. We've got, I've got a postdoc, I've got two, seven PhD students, I've got a couple of honours students, I've got a couple of technical <coughs> people who work in the lab with me, etc, etc. So all that sort of stuff happens in, the, in, the, in between lectures and all the other stuff. I sit on um, three recovery teams. The recovery teams we'll learn about later on in the unit. You'll actually come up with a recovery plan for a couple of different species. Um, the arid zone one, which is the Central Australian one, which are things like Amperda, the Mala, which are really important indigenous um, kangaroo. Uh, the Shark Bay one, which is a whole lot of fauna that sit off Shark Bay. It's becoming quite a big area at the moment with reintroductions of the foray and a lot of the islands up there. And I also sit on the Quokka recovery team. We're about to meet in a couple of weeks' time. And I've worked on a bucket load of different things. So I'm not just working on kangaroos, or koalas, etc. I work on irukandji, box jellyfish, um, I had projects on mala, perda, rock wallabies, ghost bats, owls, fish, etc. 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 So I guess this is my counter to people who sort of might think that I don't actually know what I'm talking about. So I've got a relatively large amount of experience. It also allows us to work in a huge number of different fields, so we're quite variable. Okay, enough about me, that was just a big load of talk. Welcome to um, Conservation Biology. The idea of this lecture is to act as a basically an introduction to Conservation Biology and the framework with it, which it operates. 
a little bit about why it matters and how we've got to this situation where we're at the moment. We're we'll talking a little bit about the history of conservation biology and how it's evolved. It's a relatively new field. What do conservation biologists do as opposed to uh, wildlife managers or people working in, say, wildlife ecology? It's another unit to do with Kate next semester. Um, and why is that different than conservation biology? And then lastly, just to talk a little bit about how the unit's structured. Um, and hopefully a lot of that will be obvious already. Okay. So what's conservation biology? It's a relatively new synthetic field uh, that's been developed in uh, the response to basically things that are changing, but not only changing, but happening very fast. So what used to happen over evolutionary timescales is now happening over hundreds of years. So climate change would be one I would think that you guys would be well and truly aware of at the moment, particularly this year if it's been dogged. So there are three goals in conservation biology. One is to document biodiversity and what we actually have. The other one is to work out what's actually changing these ecosystems and communities and, um, and structures. So the, the obvious candidates that I think you'll already know, and I'll talk about in a second. And to develop practical ways that we can try and mitigate those changes. In other words, come up with management plans or attacks that we can actually use on and based on evidence-based science rather than gut feelings to try and work out how we can change things. So why is conservation biology needed? Um, this is a really neat composite photo. Um, so it's a series of photos put together, but it demonstrates fairly nicely the impact that humans have on the planet. I think you've probably said this a couple of times in the unit, and it doesn't take too much imagination to work out that it has, and we have, an enormous impact on what's happening for the globe, and then based on certain lives that humans are. And we have a pretty appalling record in terms of our impact on these species, and this is not new stuff. And this is uh, basically just to sort of list the candidate, usual candidates, things like introduced diseases, uh, sorts of pollution, fragmentation of habitat, the over-exploitation of, uh, of animals um, and plants, loss of habitat, and uh, importantly at the moment, this whole debate about climate change. So how do we actually impact? Um, we have this um, concept called biodiversity hotspots. Does anyone know what is it a good thing or a bad thing? Does anyone know for having it? So we have, for instance, in southwest of Australia, um, one of the world biodiversity hotspots. Intuitively, you sit there and think it's a good thing. You can't be a biodiversity hotspot unless the species there are in trouble, basically. That's right. So it sounds all trendy, sounds great hotspot. Well, that's a really cool area for biodiversity. The meaning of biodiversity hotspot and to reach the criteria for it is that you need to have a bucket load of species in there. So in Western Australia, we've got over 1,500 vascular plants, but it also has to have lost 70% of its primary vegetation. And this is the problem in, in the southwest of WA, which is why it's been declared a hotspot. Anyone know how much area of the wheat belt has been cleared? Everyone will be aware of the wheat belt. Basically goes from Shark Bay down through to Albany. Anyone got any concept of how much vegetation has been cleared over that area? Could we also talk about it? 90% of vegetation vanished over the wheat belt. It's a fractured and uh, abysmal situation. So we need conservation biology because it gives us the framework to try and understand and how we can better manage these things. We know that the threats are accelerating. Things are not slowing down. These, um, the fragmentation problems, the problems with fires, for instance, in the Amazon this year, have caused huge amounts of area to be, uh, to be lost. Many of them are synergistic, and by synergistic what I mean is that you can't actually manage just one aspect of the ecology of something like that. It's usually interactive. And I'll give you an example. Taking out wolves in Yellowstone National Park had an enormous effect on the ecosystem of that national park system where those top trophic predators controlled the lower preys of things like elk and uh, the rabbits, the herbivores, etc. So the vegetation changed, the vegetation changed such that there was no vegetation left on any of the river systems, so the river systems started eroding, etc. etc. So managing removal of a top predator is not the only answer. It's a whole series of things that interact. So they're synergistic, and I'll talk about a list of those in a second. The present threats are unprecedented. We have never been in a situation where the loss of things have been so high. And traditional applied disciplines in things like resource management, maximum sustainable yields, etc., etc., 
just aren't working and they're not sufficient for controlling some of the problems we have with these things. So we've had to change from a more theoretical approach and look at it in terms of an applied approach to things. And the threats to these biodiversity things are also threats to human populations directly. And by that, what I mean is if we lose biodiversity, it impacts on human populations as well. Things like bioresources, a, an enormous number of uh, pharmaceuticals and drug development and all that sort of thing have come from natural systems. Things like um, aspirins came from bark of a tree. I don't know if I've forgotten that in there. 25% of all pharmaceutical prescriptions contain active ingredients from some sort of biologically derived thing. So we're going to be losing that information. Ecosystem services, Giles will talk about this a lot, is we lose ecosystem services which are actually improving our particular life. Aesthetics, we um, derive a whole lot of good things from going out into the environment. And again, later in the unit, the guy from Rick Howe used to head the museum to talk about the importance of getting out in nature and engaging in it and the health benefits and things like that. So, so. Koalas, for instance, bring $70 million to the Australian industry just by going and looking at them. Not anymore because they're all burnt, but basically they employ or they contribute quite a large amount of money to the economy. And lastly, the ethics. We have a, uh, almost an obligation to make sure that what was here when we were born is here when we leave the place. So um, <coughs> driving things to extinction is not a good thing. Okay, and to get to where we are now requires just a little bit of what happens in terms of uh, historical perspective. So I want to talk about how conservation biology has changed over the years from sort of medieval times to where we are at the moment. Back in medieval times, so back a long time ago, um, we had a very European mindset in terms of our conservation ethic. And wilderness and wild things, I've just come back from Europe and spent Christmas and um, you know, the winter in the middle of Denmark and Germany. And you go into the middle of those forests and they're really quite sinister, dark, nasty places. But there's a couple of things missing. One is wolves and the other one are a whole lot of predators and things like this that are banished bears and stuff like this. So when you went for a walk in the woods back in the good old days, it was scary, it was wild, and you could potentially die from something eating it. So these were considered wilderness areas and they needed to be controlled, they needed to be tamed. And we had a very, as I said, European sort of centric way of looking at hunting and resources use in those areas to try and make some sort of um, value from them and to control the, the, the scariness of them, I suppose. So nature should be converted into wealth as fast as possible, and they should benefit us. That um, generally periods in our recent history uh, have involved basically depleting those areas of natural resources and making some sort of uh, use for them. So in other words, if we industrialise these areas, make these scary areas manageable, they become progressive and they become more habitable. Uh, but that was a very different place back then. There were very few people, and the actual footprint and impact on the environment was very minimal because there simply weren't enough people around there to do it. So it was very much a subsistence hunting type environment. So you basically caught things that you would then consume. So if things were killed, you would take them back, you would preserve them, make them available for over winter when you couldn't catch them, etc, etc, etc. And it wasn't market hunting. We weren't, they weren't trying to make money from these things. So rather than take 10 deer, they would take one deer and utilise as much as they can from it, the skins, the bones, etc, etc, etc. So we had a very, what I refer to as utilitarian view uh, um, of the natural world. Early on in, in the area, and these are American um, field biologists, I suppose, um, Emerson and Thoreau came up with this idea and they founded what they call the Transcendentalist Movement in the US. And that Transcendentalist Movement said that basically we should make as much use of these natural resources as possible. So that natural resources should be used to benefit humans and they're considered separate commodities. In other words, humans are better, more special, and able to control everything else in the environment. Then, come, uh, then came along a guy called um, Gifford Pichon, uh, and he was saying, he had the year of President Roosevelt in the US, so he was quite an influential sort of person, and he came up with this idea that we can't use these things and we, we are not the owners of those resources. 
So things started to change. And what happened was that things like immigration increased. Railroads became and allowed access to tenure and land areas that you couldn't access previously. And we started to use these resources for building and mining, etc. Like I said before, 90% of the wheat land woodland, uh, the wheat belt woodlands have gone now. Does anyone know where that timber went? And it didn't go into bonfires for bogans. 90% of the wheat belt is an enormous area. <coughs> where do they take all the timber? Good exam question. Well, I'm going to tell you the answer. They used it in mining. So it was used for wood to make all the mine shafts and things like this. They did use them for railways and stuff like that. The main, main problem with timber and the wheat belt was the increase in the mining industry. To the effect that the mining industry has taken 90% of the timber and woodland and the ecosystem out, which is obviously a huge amount taken out. So it led to this sort of very early on evolution of setting aside areas to preserve things. So it was in the late 1800s that Yellowstone National Park was established. Um, not long after the Royal National Park in Sydney, just south of Sydney, if anyone been there, it's quite a nice area actually. Absolutely right on the border, of, in the middle of the Sydney CBD almost, it's just south of it. Um, and then different area things like the Sierra Club, which is to do with um, birds um, and appreciation of nature became important. So as I said, Kishon had the ear of uh, President Roosevelt, which is one of the US presidents, and it started a whole new generation of thinking about the way we manage and use these ecosystems. And the days where things were ripe for the picking sort of vanished, and we moved more into an idea, the idea that um, he was the first, and, and with Leopold, who's another one, who's the first professor in University of uh, Wisconsin. These are these uh, universities up in the northwest of the, of, of the US. Uh, quite progressive. And they came up with this idea of a sort of a biocentric view of uh, managing these things. The biocentric view is that humans are part of the environment. We are not intrinsically different or better or more superior than the rest of that community. So basically, Conservation systems can't just be based on a human perception of how we and what we can use as a resource and earn money from, because most of those things don't have any money. What's a koala worth? I don't know. I wouldn't have a clue. It's a very difficult number to come up with. So what we need to realise is that evolution and how our community systems have produced complex, really elaborate, diverse systems that are interactive. They're, we are not intrinsically different from any other part of that system. And this is what Leopold came up with. So I guess where they came and what's happened is we've gone from a situation where we're striking a little bit of a balance between complete over-exploitation, total control of nature, or the other option is that sort of preservationist view on the way things work, where we shouldn't interrupt and we shouldn't touch anything and nothing changes, etc., etc. Both of them are completely unrealistic. We are not going to be with an expanding population in a situation where we conserve everything, but we're also in a stupid situation if we think that we can just completely control and exploit everything because there simply won't be anything. So we need something sort of in the middle. Has anyone heard of Rachel Carson? The question I ask is, has anyone read The Silent Spring? No? Really interesting book. Okay. Rachel Carson was, and she revolutionised that the public's perception of how conservation is important to the community, not just um, that. What Rachel Carson did was she meticulously detailed the role that DDT plays in the ecosystem. And she used uh, evidence based science to document how DDT was accumulated through the food chain. She had biochemists working on when you ingest DDT, particularly in bird species, the calcium involved with shell production gets taken in metabolizing the DDT, and it's not available for shells, so therefore the shells get very thin, and basically there were eagles laying omelets. They weren't even having shells on this thing. So we lost a huge number of species, at particularly those top trophic levels, the ones that are eating things further down the line. And so we get to the stage where they're accumulating that DDT, and then they're unable to reproduce. So therefore we lose the top end predators. And it was Rachel Carson who did that. And it was a really influential book called Silent Spring. And if you've ever got any time, 
well and truly worth the read because it's just absolutely an amazing work. And why was it important? Well, it was important because it challenged the way that agricultural government, agricultural scientists and governments and the people that were involved in forest management, um, harvesting, etc., etc., thought about those ecosystems because they used to think of them purely as a way of generating money when in fact there are trickle down effects. It was um, one of the first cases of what they referred to as evidence-based conservation management. So one of the things about evidence-based conservation are, and I will talk about this in another lecture later, really at the end of the unit, is things like, um, does light affect turtle hatchling movements off beaches? And intuitively you sit there and go, of course it does. But the evidence shows that the lights have no effect on where turtles move off those beaches based on some science and setting up a whole series of experiments. So that's reason evidence-based science is really important. And of course, it raised fundamental questions about the impact that we're having on the environment, not for the first time, but certainly at a very public level. So it's had a really profound effect. I'm not expecting you to remember any of this. It's just simply to put it up there and show you that there were a huge number of people that had impacts in conservation areas and a number of Australians as well. So we've got some really fantastic scientists. Dick Frankham, who works in conservation genetics. Graham Corley, who wrote um, some really seminal papers. Otto Frankel, George Heinsen, who's um, someone I had as a supervisor up in North Queensland, worked on um, Northern Bandicoots really early on. And it was Michael Sule who basically founded a, the group or the Society for Conservation Biology in 1985. This was the year, I oh, know I'm going to tell you what that year was. It's not that long ago. 1985 was when the field Society for Conservation Biology was formed by Mike Sule. So it's a relatively new area. And its um, role has increased as a whole lot of things have come into things. Things like the role of water availability, change of climate, and you know things like presidential elections have huge impacts on how these things work. Okay. So what have we learned from over those sort of last 500,000 years or so? One is natural resources are public property. We own and we are part of those systems. Um, there is personal and public concern which drives these things and I think everyone would be well and truly aware that this year has had a huge impact on people's thinking about terms of climate change, about change in fire regimes, fire management, etc., etc. So that's been a big pulse this year that wasn't really there or has been really poorly our leadership has shown very poor leadership in terms of driving climate change debate. This year, I think, has changed that completely. Uh, we have a better idea about the underlying forces and, and, and things that cause those changes. And of course, we have this real problem which we don't seem to be getting our head around is the idea of uh, the human population just seems to be increasing forever and ever. <coughs> so how is it different from other biological sciences? Um, one of the things it is, is, as I said earlier on, is it's a synergistic field and it requires inputs from a whole range of different things. Now, you're doing a course in conservation biology where, unfortunately, the unit coordinator has a very strong conservation genetics bent. So we'll spend a reasonable amount of time talking about conservation genetics. But there are a whole lot of conservation biologists involved with economics, with uh, policy, uh, with chemistry, statistics, etc., etc. So I imagine this course would be quite different if you had it done in some other institution by someone with a different sort of focus than maybe what I've got. We try to give you a very broad sort of perspective of what's going on here, but um, obviously you've got a bit of a bend in my area. But conservation biology is basically pulls together a whole lot of different people. There are anthropologists, there are politicians, there are economists, etc., etc. So very synergistic. Okay. So how does it focus and distinguish it from different um, areas in biological sciences? Well, conservation biology focuses on preservation of life itself. It's value-laden and mission-driven. And by that, what I mean is, you come out of this degree, you're a conservation biologist, and you go and apply for a job with the environment team at uh, BHP or Rio Tinto, and you'll be working in that team trying to put together science and management of how they would manage their resources extracting gold and um, oil or whatever they're doing. But if you came out with a conservation biology degree and then worked for the World War WWF, World Wildlife Foundation, or AWC, or another one of those NGOs, then the way you look at conservation and those areas will be somewhat different than if you're working for a mining company. Does that make sense? You're still using conservation biology, 
but you're using them in very different ways. So I guess what I'm saying is it's value laden. You can put a bent on it, whichever way you think it should go. Advocacy driven, it's a crisis orientated field. We're at the stage because things are turning pear shaped and they're turning and they haven't changed the other way. So we really are in this pretty poor situation. As I said, multidisciplinary or synergistic brings together a whole lot of different areas. It's concerned with evolutionary time. We're not interested in saving a cockatoo or a boiling or a bandicoot or a quokka. What we're interested in is in a hundred years' time, is there a sustainable, biologically diverse population of quokkas living around Western Australia? Does that make sense? So things, the area, that sort of area, there's a, there's a, a mob here called um, <coughs> veterinary conservation, no, conservation medicine, it's called. And basically a black cockatoo comes in, you know, you fix the wing and then you let it go and you know you think you've saved the world. That's not conservation biology. It's saving one particular individual. It's a very inexact science. Um, it's an adaptive science. So what I guess I mean by that is that we come up with a plan and we sit there and go, well, based on the evidence we've got at the moment, this is probably the best strategy to go in terms of trying to save this thing. You go down that path and you revise that, and we'll look at this in the recovery plans later on in the unit is we look at KPIs, and if we're not reaching those KPIs and it's not working, then we have the ability to go back and go, right, yeah, things aren't working, what have we got to change to make to, to ensure that so there's some sort of change and difference in that thing? So in other words, we might change the management plan after a year if it's not actually working. Legally empowered, we sign international treaties, so we, are, we have legal obligations to do a lot of this work. Uh, it's the application of policy. So I think what you will find is through the unit, that um, really all we're doing is we're taking those principles that you would have learned in ecology and we're putting a very applied sort of bent on it and trying to manage the species. So conservation biology is taking ecology and applying it to try and understand how we can help things. And as I said, it's a science on an evolutionary time scale. We're looking at long periods of time. We're not really interested in the day-to-day -day survivorship of things. We want to sit there and go, in 100 years' time, let's make sure this thing's still around. So that's how it's distinguished from other things. Things like conservation uh, wildlife management that uh, you might do next semester with Kate, fantastic. Is uh, that's really concerned with um, it's really concerned with sort of managing that particular species. <coughs> might be northern hairy nosed wombats or you know jarwin rhinos if they still exist, etc. Et okay, I think I've been through that. Okay, so just a bit of a chat about how the unit works and sort of how Giles and I sort of think in terms of the unit. Um, hopefully it's relatively straightforward. I'm hoping again, most of you, I sent out some documents a month or so ago, I think, which sort of gave you a breakdown of the unit, the guides, the essay questions, etc., etc. So hopefully you have a little bit of a heads up of what's in the unit. Um, we uh, have, I just want to talk about assessments, some of the workshops, etc., etc. Okay. Just before I start, I want to talk about this thing, uh, the glossary, which is on the web page. If you look at the web page right at the top, there's a glossary section. And I think this is, in my opinion, really important, <coughs> and I'll try and explain my way through this, is, um, does anyone know what this thing is? You know, does it know? It's called Dryandra Sissel, it's called Carrot Bush. It's really common to uh, uh, see it everywhere. So the Dryandra sessilis is this um, spiky, nasty, gnarly thing, which is typical of most of the plants in West Australia. Um, and about, uh, it be a while ago now, it's probably about 10 years ago, uh, they had a complete name change. So you can't find, or this is not the correct name for that species anymore, all the Dryandras, which are this group of sort of Banksia looking things, all got amalgamated into the Banksia group. So this is now Banksia sessilis, not Dryandra sessilis. There is a point to this. Anyone know what this thing is? Any birdos here? Kingfisher. It's sort of a kingfisher. Yeah. How many species of kingfisher are there? Anyone know? Common kingfisher. Sorry? Common kingfisher. Yeah. This is known colloquially in different areas of the world as the common kingfisher, Eurasian kingfisher, river kingfisher, small kingfisher. There are some six subspecies of this thing that occur within its distribution. The point of what I'm saying is, is that there's one word with which all of these things are known as, and that's its genus and species. So regardless of where you are in the world, that remains the same, but names change all the time depending on where you are. 
And I guess what I'm trying to do with this glossary is to instill in you that you need to raise the bar a little bit in terms of how you're using <coughs> language in conservation biology and other areas that you're going to be doing in third year. In first year and second year, it's fine to use fairly colloquial sort of language because that's the level it's at. Whereas now what you want to be thinking about are those very exact words that fit the exact situation. Imagine you're getting surgery on your foot and the doctor comes in and says, oh, I just hit him down and right down the end of that foot there over on the left-hand side. You come out with half your toes missing because they don't understand what they're supposed to be doing. If you're going to be doing surgery, they will know exactly what bone, what tendon, etc., etc. The language will be very medical. I don't actually understand it, so I can't explain it. Does that, does that make sense to people? So you would be using very specific language about what we wanted particularly done in that operation. So the glossary has a bucket load of terms and words that are, if you were to turn up to an interview and start using some of those words, then you would be in a very high standing to get a job. Whereas if you turn up and just talk about, oh, you know, we sort of took some stuff and we put it there and we added a few things later on, you know what I mean? It's mumble jumble. Whereas if you've got those words where you're actually using those very specific words, then it comes across incredibly well. And you will do very well in exams and essays if you start using it as well. So I guess what I'm saying is I'd encourage you that if you see and hear words that we chuck around in the unit, is go and have a look at the glossary. And the glossary is not the be end and end all. It's just to sit there and see to try and go, okay, let's go with Dr. Google and actually do a search and say, what was that funny little word he used? Because I don't actually understand what it is. And then to lift it up a level. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Okay. So that's the idea of the glossary. Okay, in terms of the textbook, um, we don't have a prescribed text because we're both really aware that you have eight units you're going to do this year. Each of these damn textbooks is 100 plus bucks. And all of a sudden, you've got no money in your bank trying to buy textbooks for the unit. Conservation biology is an incredibly diverse field, so every textbook has a slightly different focus, etc., etc. We don't really follow one particular one, but we have used Richard Primack's one as a sort of a basis for our lectures. So, as best we can in the lectures, we'll reference back to chapters in that book. But my advice is, if you want a book, it's a great book. Don't get me wrong, but if you're a bit up the top for money, then maybe think about perhaps borrowing one from the library. If you're super desperate, I can leave you mine on if you like. But um, you can get it from the bookshop, um, but you can go somewhere else, which is not going to be captured. And if you go to the book depository, um, that same book will uh, cost you substantially less uh, than buying it from the bookshop. I think the bookshop was 170 bucks or something like that. Anyway, so I guess what I'm saying is look around if you want the textbook. There are cheaper options in the bookshop. I'm going to get fired out of that for next one. <laughs> okay, in terms of the, um, the unit page, hopefully it's very self-explanatory. Uh, we have uh, a lecture at the moment, and in the lecture material, I'll talk about that in a little second, uh, we have a whole lot of information. So if I go to the first bit, the unit information timetable, this is all sort of more the administration of the unit. And hopefully it's really obvious. There's a unit guide in there. There's the workshop book. And as I said in that email, I guess we'll give you the options. Of, there's a PDF version. I'd probably be using that one. Um, or you can go to the bookshop and buy it as well. I thoroughly recommend it, but I think it's a waste of time. So that's already up as PDF as well. The lecture timetable in terms of you have this lecture and then Mike's coming in in a second. Um, so obviously it has the lectures. Um, by far, I think the most important document, um, because the timetable is a bit... I mean, I mean, it's really weird. They've set up some really weird stuff where you can't enroll. I can't move you into classes because it tells me you've got clashes, so they don't allow you know, So we can't do a lot with it. This is the document I think you should use each week. Where should I be this week? And so basically, uh, it's a list of what we're actually doing in the week, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, last is the workshop field, uh, field trips and timetable, and a little bit of other stuff about changing unit. In terms of lectures, if you hit the lecture tab, this is what you'll turn up if you look at Mike's one. And in that, I hope you'll get the idea of that we've tried to provide a whole lot of supporting scaffold material for each of the lectures. The, the lecture, the, the writing's small, don't worry about it too much. Basically, in each one, we try to give you a, a lecture in terms of a PDF, and we will endeavour to try and put them up before the lecture starts. That is not always the case. If we've got guest lectures or we're still writing it as we go, we may not get it up in time, okay? We will make every effort to, but I can't guarantee it. It will be up as soon as possible once we get it. 
that may not be up directly in time for the presentation. Uh, we also get into detail of the person getting it. So Mike Hull is going to come and talk to you in a second. Uh, we've got his room number and uh, his email if you want to actually go and contact him. I, just, I didn't understand that bit or whatever. And we're more than happy to sit there and actually try and make you understand or give you some more information. There's learning objectives. So if you're studying for the exam, these are the bits you really want to be able to answer and answer really well. And there's a whole, usually, series of supportive things. Things like web pages that you can go to, some of the keywords, um, so the glossary items or terms of interest. In other words, those words that we would use in that lecture that have additional meaning. You may want to go look through those as well. So that's the way the lectures. And so for each lecture, we have that plan. So hopefully there's lots of stuff there to help you. In terms of assessment, we've got, again, lots of little things, a couple of big things, but we've tried to spread it out over the semester. There's some group exercises, there's an essay, etc. So hopefully you've seen that all already. Um, and the marks sort of vary a little bit, but they basically, we've tried to manage it so that not one piece of assessment's worth 90% of the unit. Overall, we should do, and most people do very well in the unit, just by participating in each of the activities. Essay questions, I think three really neat questions. One is the role of um, genetically modified organisms on biodiversity. So all of a sudden, instead of having all these wild varieties, you've got one species of genetically modified, very sweet pink corn or whatever they're developing for that year. So what's the effects of biodiversity uh, on, uh, made from genetically modified organisms? Other one, we're going to have a talk later on by someone who's working on what they refer to as short-range endemics. Does anyone know what it is? A species with a very tiny local distribution. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember the number. It's sort of species that live within sort of 200 metres or something or other. There's some number of them. Don't hold them to it, but it's, it's quite a short range. So these species only inhabit particular mesas in the Pilbara. And the next mesa along, next mountain, has a completely different suite of species on it. So these are referred to as short-range endemics. So they're endemic to those mesas, very small distributions. Why the hell conserve those sort of things? Just blow the thing up and we've got another couple down the hill. So it's a very interesting debate. So in my opinion, really interesting answer that question. And the third one is the impact and what they're having in terms of biodiversity conservation. So a classic example would be something like Western Swamp Tortoise. Everyone aware of these little guys? They're really cute little turtles. Tortoises. Things that live in lakes. They, um, they're highly endemic to a couple of lake systems around Perth. The problem is, is the waters aren't in those lakes for long enough for these things to breed anymore. So what happens is uh, that they run out of time for the young to develop, and therefore they can't generate new individuals. So they need to be thinking about where can we use and, and what other resources can we use to save this species as the climate starts to have an impact on drying up and things like that. So again, I think it's a really interesting essay question. Okay, you need to choose just one of them. And it's due in week 11. Okay, I think. Have a look at the dates. Does that make sense to everyone? So the essays are quite, quite good. So you sort of think you could start now. Okay. In terms of the organisation of the unit, um, we have two lectures on Thursday morning, which is now. So thanks very much for coming on to this. We have one activity in the week. So we're either going to go on a field trip, or there's a seminar, or there's a computer lab, or we're going on another field trip, or there's another, etc. Et we're not doing multiple things in a week, and we're not doing multiple things within a day. It's one thing or something else. And like I said, the best option, in my opinion, is to follow this, what, are we, what on earth are we doing this week? Um, so this afternoon, we've got one at 1.30. It will go for a short time. It won't be very long this afternoon. Giles is going to talk about risk assessment, which is to do with the Penguin Island field trip. And I'm going to talk about the seminars that's coming up. So we need to organise you all into groups. Uh, it's a bit of a mess to begin with, but it'll get sorted. Um, and the other risk assessments and seminars. So we've got those things to get through and then we can move on. So it should be fairly short, pretty straightforward, very little. You just got to come along and try and sort out which group's going to be in. Um, as I said, there's two things we need to sort out. Um, and it, it, you might be able to give us a bit of thought between now and when we have this seminar at 1.30. It's down in the law building, by the way. I don't know where it is, but somewhere down there. Is if you look on the web page under seminars, there's the first seminar, it's called Species Riches, and there are four different groups, one at 1.30 and one at 4.30. Timetabling would only allow us to book you all for 1.30 to 4.30. In other words, we didn't have any choice about this, but what I've done is just randomly assign people to one of a group of four. Could you have a look and make sure you're in a group 
that your name is in one of those groups and record what time you're doing it and what room. So the obvious once you get this afternoon. There's another one in the workshops under, under the computer workshops. And again, there's two workshops, one at 1.30 and one at 4.30, and I'll split the class into two because there's only capacity for about 40 people in each room. So we can't go over those amounts very much. So just have a quick look at that as well. Okay, and this is what I said about this where should I be thing. So today we've got two lectures, and then we're meeting down in the law teaching space for a workshop on this stuff here. Next week, we meet down at Mersey Point, which is down south near Rockingham, right up the car, and then we're going to go over to Penguin Island. Uh, we, I'll talk about this this afternoon. We pay for the trips, we pay for the, the ferries to get across, we bring in the head ranger from Trollwater Marine Park to talk about how they manage and stuff like this. It's, it's good fun, so hopefully I'll, it'll, it'll make sense of it this afternoon. The following week we've got a computer workshop, etc. Et so one thing on any one week, but it does vary. We're going on field trips and workshops, etc. Hopefully, it's a bit of a mix and uh, you actually, you'll, you'll enjoy it. Okay, the final exam, we've broken up into four sections now. There's a short multi-choice section. There's another one where we pick out glossary terms and we sit there and say, in a sentence or a paragraph, can you tell us what the meaning of this is? And compare it to that. So again, um, you know, if you spend a bit of time, and my advice to you in glossary would be to spend time throughout the semester looking at those, some of those words and trying to figure out what they are. The third section is to do with field trips, and on the field trips, one of the comments last year was, what an absolute waste of time it was going to Penguin Island, we did nothing. I don't know why those people do the unit, but in my opinion, I think it's a really valuable exercise. So what we've done is we're now going to give you a page of questions that you'll need to look at and try to answer if you are coming on the field trip or even if you're not coming on the field trip. And we're going to pick two questions from either Penguin Island, the Herbarium, Kings Park or Perth Zoo and that will be in section three of the exam. So we'll ask two, two of those questions. So you've had them all before. If you answer the questions, simple. And the fourth section is towards the end of the semester we'll give you five questions. They're quite broad in their thinking and we'll randomly choose one of them. In fact, one of you guys will choose one of those questions. You won't know which one it is and that question will turn up in the final exam. So you'll have to answer one of those five questions in the final exam. Does that make some sense to everyone? The final exam, I think most people who I talked to from last year said they were a bit worried because it's a bit vague and we're not sure what's happening and they turned up and went, it's actually pretty straightforward. So hopefully you'll have most of the questions done even before you've actually gone in there. Okay. And lastly, talking about this zoo points. Now, this has been an interesting exercise every year. Is there are people in the unit who really don't give a rats about anything in the unit, they don't come to anything, they don't participate. They come to the field trips, uh, but they don't come to any lectures, any workshops, they don't hand anything in. And in my opinion, those people, that's fine, you can do what you want, but we have a field trip at the end of the semester going behind the scenes at Perth Zoo. It's quite a good trip. Um, we go to look at a number of different things. You might look at Western Swamp Tortoise breeding program or Carnivies program or Numbats, depending on what's on display. If there are breeding animals, they tend not to go there. But it's a bit of fun. And if you've come to everything, you'll feel not come to everything. If you're coming to the unit and you're participating, don't worry about it. It's, uh, you'll be fine. But if you're not coming to anything, then you may not get that email at the end of it. And I'll explain that in the, in the unit guide, so hopefully that's relatively clear. Now that's a bit of a bribe to come and actually participate in the unit. It's a good fun unit. Not particularly hard. Okay, well, I'm going to finish there. Anyone have any questions? Yep. Um, I saw the field trips on things like May at 1230 at like the location that yeah. I know some of us have, yep. you know, workshops prior to that, that yeah. So the problem we have is, if you say turn up, so I think it'll all work out. Every other year's been the same, and we've had clashes with either lectures or with turning out, you know, things like that. So really, we need to be there at one, and I think the ferry actually leaves back quarter past one, one thirty. If you say one thirty, there will be a truckload of people who wander in at two o'clock going, hmm, we didn't realise. So all you do is you say it's 12, everyone turns up by 12.30, and absolutely everyone's there by one, which is great. Does that make sense? So, it's been a bit cheeky. It's, it's usually about one. And we'll be finished by four for most of those field trips as well, so they finish fairly early. And with the workshops as well, you know. With the time, oh, okay. So, this is where I need to get you, I guess, I guess you just need to think a little bit carefully about which workshop you've been assigned to. 
if you've been assigned to the 130 workshop but you've got a clash that you don't think you can make, that 130 you should be able to, because I think they're all finishing about 12, so is that right? All the clashes? So you should be able to reach your time, but I guess it would be better if you were at the 431. Gives you a bit of time to get together and make sure everything's working and stuff. If you've got a seminar or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you think there's going to be a clash, please get on to me and I'll try to move people around. But yeah. So those lists are a bit flexible at the moment. You may change, so just keep your eye. Enjoy the unit. I think it's good fun. Um, one of the things I will do, and we will do every so often, is we'll chuck this roll around. So what I'm going to do is put this out there, and if you could just sign and say that you've come today, it just allows us to keep a record of who's participating. So that will go around randomly. Thanks. And you can give it to Mike at the end.